Today's webinar is Intermediate Risk Bladder Cancer, Understanding Your Treatment Options. Navigating a diagnosis of bladder cancer can be really overwhelming. Non-muscle invasive is just as overwhelming as muscle invasive, and there's so many unknowns. When I started at the Bladder Cancer Advocacy Network 10 years ago, you were either diagnosed with low-risk non-muscle invasive bladder cancer or high-risk. Nobody talked about intermediate risk. So today, Beacon is delighted to welcome you to an engaging and informative webinar with Dr. Joshua Meeks, a urologic oncologist and scientist at Northwestern University in Chicago. Dr. Meeks has almost 20 years of experience in the diagnosis, treatment, and management of bladder cancer and has completed many, many, many research projects specifically focused on bladder cancer. He re received his medical and PhD degrees from Northwestern University in 2005 and completed a urology residency at Northwestern in 2011, a urologic oncology fellowship at Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York in 2012. He'll provide a comprehensive overview of treatment options specifically tailored for patients with intermediate risk non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. So remember to add your questions to the Q&A box at the bottom as you think of them and we'll answer them at the end. Dr. Meeks, I'm going to turn it over to you and I'm looking forward to your presentation. I'm really excited that you asked me to do this because uh, I agree with you totally that the, the whole group of we call intermediate risk bladder cancers. And, and the first thing we're going to do is talk about what that actually is. But like it's such a patient driven concept uh, I have a lot of folks I care for here in Chicago that are intermediate risk. And like, you know, the great point you made is that like for each each of our patients, that cancer is the most critical thing in their life. And it's not it's not fair to do a comparison of life threatening or non life threatening. Uh, when I'm when I'm with somebody and we're talking about where they are in their journey, this is the most critical thing to them. And what I'm excited about is that there's so much coming on the horizon for this group of folks where I'll tell you not, you know, five years ago, I had very little to offer them. So again, I think this is a really exciting space and I'm so happy that we're, we're addressing this today. Here are my disclosures. And again, I think much of this has to do with trials that we're going to be talking about because, and I think again, it calls attention to the fact that our partners uh, and pharma are interested in this space because a lot of this involves, um, intermediate risk. So uh, I'm going to talk today about intermediate risk, how we define that, um, uh, and then what are our, our outcomes and expectations for patients with intermediate risk. Uh, we're going to talk about how I approach them and how what, what the standard of care is. Uh, and then we're going to talk about treatments. And I think the exciting parts at the end, because again, there's a lot more in the space that that's developing. All right. So intermediate risk and, and how we define that. So uh, first question people ask is, what actually is this? And so to, to put a tumor in uh, intermediate risk or to say that a patient is intermediate risk, we need information from the TURBT. So what you're seeing is a video of what a TURBT looks like. This is the surgery itself. Um, and, and so as we're doing the surgery, the clinician needs not only the pathology, that will come, but also in general recording the size of the tumor um, and the number of tumors, like that's what we get from the surgery. So the surgeon, as if you ever read an operative report, that information is usually described there. And then that's combined with the pathology report and together we're able to establish a, a risk classification. So um, this is often hard because when usually I meet somebody, they wanna know what's the next steps after surgery, but really we can't do that until after the surgery is done we know what things look like at surgery, and then we get the pathology report. So putting all that together, we're able to come up with a risk status. And, and so that there's really basically three risk status that people use. This is from the AUA because we're a urologist in the US, so it's the American Urologic Association. And really the AUA has set up three groups. And I kind of lump these into four major characters here. So. The, the turtles of bladder cancer are the low risk tumors. And generally like they're pretty slow growing. That's why we call them the turtles. They're, they're you know, low grade tumors, single tumors under three centimeters. 
So very small. Um, I think this intermediate risk group we'll talk about is, you know, bigger low grade tumors, tumors that come back within a year, multifocal, meaning they're in more than one area. Uh, in the US, we say that a high grade tumor under three centimeters is considered intermediate risk. And then the high risk is everything else. And, and those are much more like, you know, I, I would consider them sort of the wolves of bladder cancer in that they're, they tend to be more aggressive. You have to worry about them more. And then there's sort of the bears that are kind of the, the apex predator of bladder cancer that I worry about a ton. Again, we're not talking about those today, but but that's more patients, you know, tumors with lymphovascular invasion, some variant histology. But again, today we're talking about those, the, the rabbits or the intermediate risk. Now, this is very clinical. This is this is just to show you that there are three different kinds of classifications. Um, and I kind of wanted to, to spend a second on that. And so to hit the easy button and to say, how do other people around the world think about this? They basically say, okay, there's, there's low risk patients. So Stephanie kind of talked about those. Those are low grade, small tumors, individual, single ones. That's low risk. High risk is anything high grade, anything stage one, anything with carcinoma in situ, that's all high risk. And then intermediate is everything else. So it's a big group of patients. And I think there's a lot of value to this, even though we don't use this specifically in the, in the US, but I think that kind of fits this group. So basically we're talking about recurrent or multifocal low-grade cancers that keep coming back. And when I think about these, the, these are uh, usually patients that, that I work with that are extremely frustrated by their cancer that, again, even though it's not life-threatening, these are cancers that keep coming back and we just don't have a great solution for them. So again, recurrent or multifocal low-grade cancers, okay? Um, and so what do we expect? We talk about recurrence. And so I kind of want to be very clear about our outcomes here. So we have recurrence, which means a tumor coming back at all. You know, most of the time it's going to be those same low grade cancers. That's called, that's a recurrence. Progression is when things are getting worse. So that's usually either a high grade tumor or an invasive cancer, but, but that's, that's a more concerning outcome. So when you look at these outcomes, that's a Kaplan-Meier curve. And so if we start off with 100% of patients, that's when they start after surgery, you can see that by a year, about 14% of those patients will have had a recurrence. This is without therapy. By three years, over 38% have had a recurrence. And so, you know, in general, by the time you get out to about five years, it looks like about half of patients have had some form of recurrence. Now, that's most of the endpoints that we're worried about for intermediate risk bladder cancer. It's the tumor coming back. And so I think the first thing I try to talk to folks about is um, this is often not a cancer that I don't anticipate is going to take your life. So if you look at progression, by five years, the risk of that is about 2%. So folks are very unlikely to die of this cancer. But it doesn't mean there's a significant burden of recurrence. So recurrence in these cancers are, again, about 50% at five years. So it is a cancer that will come back, and that's where our strategies are really aimed towards decreasing the risk of tumor recurrence. Um, again, progression, luckily, is a relatively rare phenomenon, and that certainly can happen. Um, but, but really what we're trying to do is keep people cancer-free. And so... Um, you know, that's the endpoint that matters the most in this field. Does that make sense? Uh, I, I think that's a critical thing for this cancer is this cancer is about getting good, long, disease-free intervals. And obviously cure in this case means cancer not coming back. Now, uh, a lot of that comes down to some of the challenges in this, in this group of patients because it is a pretty heterogeneous cancer, meaning that there's a lot of variability. So in this line, again, we're starting with 100% of patients starting at time zero. And by the time we get out to five years or 60 months, there's a big split there. And the difference in, this, in these two lines is grade. So we kind of have gotten rid of grade one, two, three, but this is an older system. 
where it's grade one versus grade two. And you can see that by going up to grade two, the rate of recurrence is significantly higher. So um, again, that kind of goes back to some of that, some of the variability in this group of patients. Now, I think the big challenge for us as providers and what we'll talk, we try and talk to the, our patients about is that there's a wide spectrum of cancers in this space. So how do you individualize that to get to kind of a Goldilocks point where you're not over treating everybody because you, you could treat everybody and give them the most amount of therapy, but you're probably providing a lot of treatment that people don't need and, and making people feel worse. Alternatively, there's a lot of people who are going to recur and some of them will progress. So how is there any way to tailor that where we're coming to every patient and saying, what matters the most to you? And what are the endpoints that matter to you? And how do we make this individualized? And, and that's kind of where we've tried to evolve as providers for our patients. Um, again, I credit Dr. Kaman and the IBCG for this classification, because basically, if you look at all the possible tumors that are involved in, in this group, we've tried to set up, or he's tried to set up a point system in order to put people into zero, one to two, or more than three risk factors. And so, you know, when you have, when I'm trying to talk to a patient about where they fit, we sort of go back to this almost every time. And I'm going to kind of do a summary at the end, but here are the factors that we think matter. So are there multiple cancers, meaning in different parts of the bladder affected? Have they had an early recurrence, meaning that within the first year, have they had more than one recurrence? Are they having frequent recurrences? So more than one tumor a year. Is the size of the tumor bigger than three centimeters? And have we previously treated them with something and they've not had a complete response? So each one of those is considered a point or a risk factor. And then based on that, we can sort of put people into no risk factors, one to two or more than three. And this is actually a, a pretty straightforward system to do. And, and again, I, 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 I don't think this is uh, information that you would say, oh, well, you're a three, you should do this. But I try to, I, you, as you'll see coming forward, this really helps to put people into different risk groups and, and, and really provides information about what we anticipate the next year is going to look like. So again, we have three risk groups and this is kind of how those risk groups pan out. Again, these are Kaplan-Meier curves. So we start off at 100% where everybody's doing great. And then we start to have events. And so you can see that the blue line, the line on top, they're having fewer events. And then the green line, that's the folks with more than three risk factors, they're having more events. And so if you look at the outcomes, you know, that if you have more than three risk factors, you're more than twofold likely to have um, to have to have an event. And so again, at, at five years for high risk patients uh, in, in this data set, it's almost 80% of people have had a recurrence and up to 17% have had progression. So again, I, I think this is an important thing as far as counseling and thinking about where, where, where people are and, and why we, for example, want to escalate some versus others. And, and again, it, it provides some, some reasoning for that. Um, I think that's an important part. Stephanie, do, is that clear? Do, do you think that makes a lot of sense? And um, do you have any thoughts about this? You know, I do think that makes sense. I have a question. You know, you mentioned something about recurrence, early recurrence is yes. within a year. So what yep. about those people that have a new tumor every 18 months? It, you know, does that, if they're consistently doing that, is that another yeah, thing that, that, that should be counted? That's an interesting group. I, I have a discussion with folks because it, it's always like, well, you're just over 12 months. And so you're not technically don't meet the definition of intermediate risk. I, I actually think they, they may be a little different. Uh, and I don't really know where to have that discussion. Um, in general, I wouldn't, if you look back to our point system here, you know, if they have, you know, if they're having, if they they wouldn't really get any points from that. So they kind of would be in zero. Um, and so if you look for the zero point group folks, 
they get the single installation and, 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 and you follow them. I tend to think if you can make it more than 12 months, which, which again would be two cystoscopies with no recurrence. In general, those folks usually do pretty well. Um, and, and I tend to, personally at least, uh, I tend to offer them more just like, you know, the fulguration in the office and would really probably not escalate them to, to treatment unless they said, you know, I just can't deal with this. So, so technically if it's a little bit more than a year, they're probably doing well. And, and in general, I, I, I try and do less is more in them. Okay. So, you know, but if they did say, you know, this, I, I love you, I love seeing you, but I hate coming in here and having this procedure every other year. Is this something we can do something, you know, a little more substantial to keep the cancer from coming back? Is that where perhaps they could be offered one of the yeah. treatments that you're going to discuss oh, a little bit later? You know, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so, so you could offer them intravesical therapy. Um, I think the concern for that, though, is like once you get to, we don't really have a way to individualize that where they're not getting a year of treatment. Um, so generally, like, you know, we, we'll talk in a bit about our treatment regimens that we offer for intermediate risk. And that's in general about 15 doses. So, you know, when you compare a scope and office based fulguration, which would happen, you know, maybe once a year or, or once every 15 to, you know, 18 months, um, I think the burden of that is much less than you know, coming in for 15 doses of therapy over the course of a year. So especially if people don't tolerate it. So I, I usually really try to, to deescalate, but if they wanted therapy, I'd say, well, why don't we just do six and see how you feel and see how it works. Um, I think one of the things that we'll talk about is the chemotherapy while we're making decisions to escalate to chemotherapy. Um, it's not only is, is it, not a free ride, but it's also not been the most effective. You know, it's one, it's not like we're offering people going from a 30% recurrence rate to zero. Um, with the best therapies we have, one of the challenges of these tumors is that, and this is kind of, again, where my scientist cap goes on, they're not that much different than the normal bladder lining. So a lot of the therapies that we've developed and the reason, for example, that you talk about high grade and high risk is that our therapies work better in those cancers because the tumor has different biology than the normal bladder lining. Many of these tumors biologically are, are pretty similar. So I, I, I think some of the challenges is finding the best therapies for them. Now, if we have therapies that are very, very effective with less toxicity in the future, that may really change how we look at this. Yeah, I don't know that anybody's got to that point yet where there's less toxicity in terms of potential for side effects or irritations and things. So, well, okay, we'll good there. points. I, I, think, points. I, yeah. I, I think there may be some we'll get to at the end that are, are, are maybe pretty close. Okay, good. All right, so um, I just wanted to mention this. So again, um, this is the number of risk factors as columns and then the chances of having progression. And again, the only point I'm making with this is as the number of risk factors go up, the risk of progression gets higher. So again, those are significantly different, suggesting that the classification is helpful and it's important to talk to, to people about kind of what, what they expect.